rejoicing. Hallelujah. Christ arose. I think I see the Reverend Ian Loughran. Yes, I do. It's so hard to tell who's here. You have to look at people's eyes, but certainly we welcome you and your wife and your little one to our service this morning. And it's lovely to see you. And we trust and pray the Lord will bless you in your time over here as well. We're turning to God's Word, uh, 2 Kings and chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. <coughs> Second Kings chapter 4, verse number 18. You will remember that the Shunammite woman showed great kindness to Elisha. And his desire was to repay that kindness. Uh, he repaid that by telling her she would have a son. She would have a child. And she, I suppose, was startled. Don't lie to me. Don't get my hopes up. But the Bible tells us that she did conceive and she bare a son at the season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. So verse 18, And when that child was grown, it fell on the day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. She called on to her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run 
to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding except for me, except I bid thee. And so she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel and came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if and he salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her, and Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. When Elisha was come to the house, behold, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. He went in therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his, hand, his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. Amen. May God bless that reading to our hearts. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank thee, we praise thee, for the privilege of being able to read in public thy holy word. This is the living word of God. We stand on holy ground. Lord, surely that was a message for each heart that is waiting before thee. And we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be pleased to come and speak to us just now. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be pleased to minister to our needs. Thank thee, Lord, that thou dost look on the heart. Man can look in outward appearance, but God sees within. And therefore, Lord, we say, have thine own way in this building. Have thy own way in this meeting. May we hear thy voice. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. That God alone may be glorified. We ask in his precious and worthy name. Amen and amen. We continue our study in the life of Elisha. And in this particular part of the word of God, there is a focus in a certain home. It is the home of the Shunammite woman. And we saw last time that this lady had a heart of kindness. She had a heart that wanted to share what she had for the encouragement in the work of God and for the servants of the Lord. And in leaving her, verse 17, as we've already said, it is told that she bare a son. And that was the prophecy that Elisha gave to her, that God would give her a son. However, there is now a time of tragedy in this home. A time of great sadness. It takes them by absolute surprise. There's no warning. There's no build up. Just in a moment, life has changed. I'm sure people can identify with that in this building. Life can change very quickly. Just a moment, just an hour, just a few seconds. I want us to look at what happened in this passage that we read under three simple headings. But I trust and pray with all my heart that the Lord will speak to each one of us and have a word in season. First of all, I want you to notice the problem described. The problem described. 
We see in verse number 18, when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. Now I'm going to stop there for a moment because I want to explain something. Between verse number 17 and verse number 18, we have a gap, a gap of time. And that gap of time is between 11 and 12 years. So between verse 17 and verse 18, we have a gap of between 11 to 12 years. Now these were blessed years because these were years when this son grew up in this home. Now the natural custom and order in Israel at that time was from birth to the age of 11 or 12 until the child's bar mitzvah when he was officially recognized as an adult. Until that time, it was the mother's responsibility to care for that child. When he came to the age of 11, 12, that supervision then passed in a great deal to the father. And the child no longer followed the mother about in the home, but followed the father about, usually to his workplace and that would have been the time whenever he learned the trade of his father. What a blessing those years had been. Of course, there's silence in scripture regarding them, but there was a period of 11 or 12 years there where the joy of a child within their home, the joy of raising that little one whom God had given. Is it not a reminder to us that really uh, there's just a little line, a little line on a page between verse 17 and verse 18 and how quickly children grow up and how little time you have them in your home and all of a sudden their adults are making their way into the world and then in the will of the Lord welcoming their own children into the world. Those were precious years, special years that we are not permitted to really look into. But from what we know of this child and this mother and this father, we know that there were years well spent. Because here is a young man who is ready and willing to work alongside his father and to engage in work. Obviously, that was a lesson in their home that they were to work to earn their keep. It's a scriptural principle. If we want to live, we have to work. And certainly in today's society, it's a very... Entitled age, people expect to be given and given and given and given, but they don't want to do anything. But it's a biblical principle that if we can, of course, we work. Obviously, some people can't, and we appreciate that, and we're so thankful that there is welfare there. But certainly, young children uh, or young people and children should be encouraged to work. It should not be viewed, as some view it, as something to avoid at all costs. But to work, whether it's in school, whether it's at home, or whether it is in the workplace. So there we have a lady blessed. But not only do we have a lady blessed in this passage, but we also have a lady bereaved. Verse number 19 to 20. And he said unto his father, that's the son, my head, my head. And he said unto a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. He took a severe headache. Now, I know there are some people who assume that it was sunstroke and in the heat of the day, he was overcome by the sun. But interestingly, one of the commentaries I read this week highlighted the fact that if you notice uh, in verse number 20, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. He didn't die until noon, so he wasn't out in the full heat of the day. He was out in the morning time. There had to be time for him to take ill. There had to be time for him to be carried back to his mother. There had to be time for her to nurse him to see if his health was going to come back again. Interestingly, his father didn't immediately consider it to be very serious. He wasn't particularly worried. Oh, he's a sore head. Send him back to his mom. Send him back to the house. But he was taken back to the house to rest. And as he was being comforted by his mother... He died. He died. Now let us not, in this congregation this morning, fill ourselves into some false sense of peace or security thinking, that couldn't happen to us. That young lad went out that morning with plans in his mind and he had started fulfilling those plans and all of a sudden he was struck down with sickness and within a short space of time he had died. Anyone sitting in this building could die today. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The Bible says that he died at noon. And we're in the noon hour. 
We're in the noon hour, and before this hour is over, any one of us could be in eternity. This is reality. The question I ask you this morning as your preacher is not, when will you die? That's not what I'm asking. But where will your soul be when you die? Where will your soul be? Friend, this is a great thrust of the gospel. This is what the Great Commission is all about. It's to go out all, to all the world and preach the gospel. And what is it? That while men are dead and trespasses and sin, and while they're going to a lost eternity, there's good news for Christ has died to give eternal life, to set the sinner free, to cleanse them from their sin and the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary. The gospel, the Great Commission, the need of the hour is to prepare to meet your God. My friend, that is an important matter. If you're not saved this morning, in many ways what I say for the rest of this message doesn't matter because the Lord has brought to your mind that you need to be saved. Your life is a vapor. Your life could end like that. And therefore you must prepare to meet your God. And as this problem is described, we see a lady blessed, we see a lady bereaved, but we also see a lady exercising faith. It's amazing to note what happens to this lady. It says, verse 21, she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door upon him and she went out. She called her husband and said, send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. She laid the boy on the prophet's bed. In her home, remember, there was a room set aside for the prophet, and she laid the boy on the bed. You see, she had faith that the prophet would have some way of helping her. She had faith that this was not the end of the matter. Now, remember who the prophet was. He was the ambassador of God. He was the spokesman or the mouthpiece of God. Effectively, if somebody wanted to know the word of God, they went to the prophet. Thank God today we have the Bible. So effectively, this woman went to get a word from God. This woman went to ask the Lord to intervene in her situation. She sought a word in her hour of need. And the best thing we can do in her hour of need is open this Bible and say, Lord, speak to me. Why was she so hopeful? Why was this woman so hopeful after her son had died? Well, I believe there are two reasons. First of all, she knew that Elijah had raised a child from death. That had happened in Elijah's ministry. And Elijah was Elisha's predecessor. And remember what happened if you turn over there to 2 Kings, uh, the chapter number 2 and verse 15. It says there, And when the sons of the prophets, which were at Jericho, saw him, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. It was known in the land that the spirit of Elijah rested on Elisha. In other words, that Elisha was in his stead and Elisha could do what Elijah did because they had the same God. So she knew that it happened before, but there was another reason. She had faith that God could and would work in her difficulty. How do I know that? Well, the first thing is this. She didn't murmur against God. She didn't murmur against God. Oh, Lord, why is this happening to me? That was not what she said. She did not murmur against God, but she acted in faith. She went to get the courage. She went to go and speak to the prophet. She did all these things, and it was in faith. How do I know for sure that what she did was in faith? How do I know for sure that these actions were not just foolish, but they were faith? Well, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11... We have it recorded for us. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and all down here, down to verse number 35. Woman received their dead, raised to life again. And by faith... Here is one of the things that happened. Woman had faith that their sons would come to life again. And by faith, that was wrought. Now we know of two instances in the Old Testament where that happened. And one was with Elisha and one was with 
Elijah. So she had faith that this would happen. And she took the journey. The journey was to Mount Carmel, where Elisha was. It was a journey of 15 to 20 miles. And it's interesting to note that her husband couldn't understand why she was going to go to the prophet. Wherefore, he said, uh, wilt thou go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. Now, the custom was that the people could go to the prophet and inquire for wisdom or ask for advice on the rest days, the holy rest days. So that would be the Sabbath, that would be the new moon, that would be the feasts or the festivals. And those would be times when people gathered together for worship and they could speak to the prophet or they speak to the priest and ask for information. He said, it's not a special rest day. It's not a normal time for us to be going to meet with the prophet. So why are you going? But faith believes God is able. And sometimes people will discourage us and sometimes people's attitude may discourage us. And that's why it's important to do what this lady did. She kept her eyes on the Lord. Because had she listened to her husband in this regard, she'd have stayed at home. And the miracle never would have happened. You know, if you meet the right person, you'll get nothing but a sorry tale of doom and gloom and defeat and all is lost and what's the point and there's no blessing. And you know what that results in? discouragement not just for the person speaking but for the person that is listening to them and I tell you avoid such people and avoid such preaching because there are preachers today who are nothing but doom and gloom and everything's wrong and nothing will ever be right let me tell you something God is still on the throne I serve a risen Savior. Praise God he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. And I don't have some doom and gloom, downhearted, discouraging message for you this morning. I have a God who's able to save and to satisfy and revive and to bless. That's the God of Scripture. That's the job of the preacher, to turn people's eyes upon the Savior. Now I could get you very depressed very quickly if you wanted. We don't have to look too far. The state of our land, state of our world, state of professing Christians. But I don't look to them for my encouragement or blessing. No, no. My joy is found in Christ. My joy is in Christ. And you listen to some Christians today, and even some preachers today, you know what you would do? you sit down and give up. Because as far as they're concerned, it's a waste, lost cause. They don't say it, but they complain about things so much as if the Lord's not able, the Lord's not able. I'm glad God is able. His purposes will not fail. His kingdom shall not uh, cease to be, but he will build it. He's promised to do so. I believe he's going to come in great glory. His joy can be experienced if we lift our eyes from our despondency and look upon the throne. What did this woman say to her husband? She said, it shall be well. Now, we have to be honest here. The translators have put in the words, it shall be. So the words are not in the original Hebrew text. The word in the original Hebrew text is the word shalom. What's that mean? It means peace. So she was saying farewell and peace be with you. Peace be with you. You mightn't believe, but I'm saying peace be with you and I'm going on in faith because God has given me a vision to see that he can do miracles. A friend, to those this morning who think all hope's gone and God will never bless, I say shalom, peace to you. We're walking away and we're watching in the light of God. We're going to see a work done for the Lord. There's absolutely no doubt about that. There is peace for the Christian. But I remind you this morning, peace comes or will only come if conditions are met. What are the conditions? Will you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 26? Here is a secret friend of peace. Here's a secret of peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Now, in the original... It is, thou will keep him in peace, peace. And whenever the same word is repeated in Hebrew, 
That's as if it was written in capital letters, in big bold font. It is to emphasize. That's why the translators have put it in as perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Who? Whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah's everlasting strength. I see a couple of things here. First of all, your mind has to be on the Lord. That means your mind has to be full of Christ. How do you have that when you're in the Bible? Secondly, it says, because he trusteth in thee. Then not only do you have to read, but you have to believe what you read. And thirdly, trust ye in the Lord forever. It has to be continual in spite of what's happening around you. He gives peace in the midst of our storm-tossed lives. He gives peace in the midst of the storm. And therefore, I can say the future is bright as the promises of God. Dear troubled soul, this morning, there's peace for you. Ah, the Prince of Peace will give you perfect peace if you turn your eyes from your problems and come to the throne and look upon him. Nothing was going to slow this woman's journey down. She said to her servant in verse 24, drive and go forward and slack not thy writing for me unless I bid thee. No, no, no. She was going to get there as quickly as she could. So that was a problem described. Secondly, the prophet sought. And we find that in verse number uh, 25 onwards. Now, in verse 25, it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Now, it's interesting to note whenever you read this passage that Elisha had great limitations because he said at the end of verse number 27, the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. And here we see the limitations of the prophet because remember, we're doing a study in the life of Elisha. So in this instance, we see the limitations he had. See, all men and women are human beings with limitations. Even preachers, especially preachers, have great limitations. If you want to be disappointed, you look at my life. But we're not to look at the lives of others. We're to look to the Lord. He is not a disappointment. And what I want you to notice about this man, he had some knowledge, some knowledge. Because in verse number 25, he said, behold, yonder is that Shunammite. He knew who she was. He knew she was coming. He knew there was a problem. So that was the knowledge that he had. But he had limited knowledge. He had limited knowledge. Because it says in verse number 27, the Lord hath hid it from me. I didn't know. I didn't know. And as I thought about that, no one has perfect knowledge. Only the Lord has perfect knowledge. For example, no one has a perfect knowledge of the word of God. No one has a perfect knowledge of the ways of God. No one has a perfect knowledge of the circumstances that take place in other people's lives. Let us think about those things for a moment. Because Elisha was standing there, this woman was making his way to her, and he, or to him, and he did not know what was going on or what had just happened. See, no one has a perfect knowledge of the word of God. And therefore, you must be careful what you read and who you listen to. Many a person says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And you know what? If you go and look for it in the Bible, it doesn't say it at all. We've no warrant to say that unless there's a book and a chapter and verse to back it up. We must be careful about matters that are applied and misinterpreted by men. Taking verses of scripture and applying them to situations which they have nothing to do with. We must be very careful that what we are being taught and what we receive is of the Lord and is accurate and is scriptural. And I know today in digital age, you have so many different television channels and so-called God channels or Christian channels. Are there many things on it are anti-scriptural and yet they stand in the name of the Lord. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you watch. Don't take everything at face value. Open your Bible and see what the word of God says. So no one has a perfect knowledge of the word of God. No one has a perfect knowledge of the ways of God. Now it's clear for us to see in hindsight that this woman had nothing to be worried about because the Lord was going to raise her child again. But she didn't know that. She didn't know that. 
And we don't always understand what God is doing. Yes, we can at times look back and understand. Sometimes we don't even look, or we don't even understand looking back. And sometimes we just haven't a clue what's going on. That's okay. It's okay not to have all the answers. The Bible says the secret things belong unto the Lord. It's okay not to always have the answer when someone asks you a question. And it's wise to admit that. In fact, I'm often reminded of that little verse, and I'll just quote it to you. And it's John's Gospel, chapter uh, 13, and verse number 7. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And I'll be honest, there are times in my life, and there are times in the ministry, and there are times in our nation, and I have absolutely no idea what's going on. But I do know this, I'm resting in his providence and wisdom and goodness. And what I do know, I obey. And the third thought is this, no one has a perfect knowledge of the circumstances that take place in other people's lives. Here was a woman coming to the man of God because there was a need in her home that she wanted help with. And therefore, we must remind ourselves that we shouldn't judge others by our human perception. Sometimes we observe behavior and we don't understand it, but we make a judgment. Remember Eli in the temple or in the tabernacle and Hannah was praying and he thought she was drunk because she was so, so much grieved in her prayer and just pouring out her sorrow before the Lord. He made that judgment. He had no right to make it for he didn't know. Sometimes, you know, maybe people pass us on the street or maybe even in God's house and maybe they don't speak or they, they're very short with us and they walk on and, oh, that's disgraceful. How dare they? Make judgments about them. Maybe they've just received very bad news. Maybe they're carrying a burden or a broken heart that we know nothing about and it's all they could do to get out of the house of God. Maybe they need a friend to put an arm around them and say, I'm praying for you. Yet we go about in judgment, don't we? And also remember, in a church situation, just like Elisha, neither the pastor nor the elders have a perfect knowledge of what's going on in your home, of what's going on in your life. And we are delighted and honored and privileged to be able to pray with you and to read with you and to help you in any way that we can. But we do need to know about the needs that you have if you want us to help you. And we're glad and willing and able to do that. I once heard of a preacher who was told off because he didn't attend a funeral of a relative of someone in his congregation. Now, of course, he didn't know about it. He hadn't been told about it. And the person was so angry. You don't love me. You don't care about me. The man didn't know about it. So he said, well, did the doctor come to pronounce the person dead? Of course he did. Well, how'd they know to come? Well, I rang them. Okay. Did the undertaker come and prepare the, the body and do the service for you? Of course he did. How did they know to come? Well, I rang them. Did the minister of the church that the person attended come and do the funeral? Yep. How did they know to come? Well, I rang them. Well, did you get the picture? And therefore, you need to let people know. And we're glad to help in whatever way we can. And we certainly don't want anybody overlooked. So don't feel you're burdening us by lifting the phone or sending a message to let us know of a need in your home or your family. Maybe something we can pray for, something we can do for you. We certainly are willing to do it because we do not have a perfect knowledge. But the second thing I noticed about Elisha is not only his limitations, but the change of heart that he had. The change of heart that he had. Because his initial reaction in verse 29, he said to his servant, gird up thy loins, take my staff in thine hand, go thy way. And at the end of the verse, lay my staff upon the face of the child. So he was going to send his servant to do the work. He was going to send his servant and that was enough, but that didn't satisfy the lady. Verse number 30. The mother of the child said, as the Lord liveth and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. 
I'm not going anywhere. You can send that servant. But I've come here and I have faith that God is going to move and I believe you're the person who has to be there. So you realize this lady wasn't going home. And she was right to persist. We know that because of what happened eventually. She refused to take no for an answer. What do we see here? This is faith, bold faith, persevering faith. We don't know now, in fairness to Alicia, if he didn't want to go or if he was just testing this lady as the Lord led him to do so. We're not sure. But at this moment, having seen that she was not going to go anywhere unless he came, he went with her and journeyed to the house. He journeyed to the house. You know, I've read somebody who commented he was maybe wrong to do that because he didn't wait on a word from the Lord. Well, friends, see in Scripture, there are times when the Lord leads us. You see, in your life, there are times when the Lord leads you. I can clearly come to Scripture and show you how the Lord led me into Bible college. I can show you how the Lord led me to be standing here today. I can show you in different things in my life how the Lord led me. But in this instance, there was a woman in need. There was a... Um, a lady who had lost her son and she was in great need. Now, you don't need a word from the Lord in that instance because Scripture tells us that we're to help those in need. We're to help those who suffer loss. We're to help those. And that's in the, the Scriptures that they had at that time, the very Torah. And sometimes people use that as an excuse. Oh, I need a word from the Lord. I need a word from the Lord about things that God has already spoken about. God's word tells us how to raise children. God's word tells us how to worship. God's word tells us how to behave as citizens in the land. God's word already tells us how to live in holiness. It tells us to attend the house of God. It tells us to pray publicly. It tells us to love our brother and sisters. Friend, it's not that we need another word from the Lord, but it's that we need a real surrender to the Lord, submission to his word, obedience to his command, a baptism of the Holy Ghost that we might be obedient to what God has revealed to us. Friend, you do not need a word from the Lord to know if you should come tonight to the meeting. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And we need to be careful that we don't use that word that seems so holy, oh, I need a word from the Lord, about things that God has already revealed in his word. Then finally, in this passage, we have the power displayed. The power displayed because you see, God's power was seen here. God's power was seen. Not only did the woman of faith, Lisha had faith too. He believed that this could be done. How do I know that? Because in verse number 30, or let's go verse 32. When Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. There is no way Elisha would have gone into that room unless he had faith that the Lord could do this work. He would not have done it, but he believed that the Lord could. Do you know there's some, and I, I, just say, I say some, modern Bible scholars, not all, but some, who present this as a parable or a legend. It didn't happen uh, in reality, but it just is a story to show how God could uh, have lots of power. That's nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. You see, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 2 of who God is. And whenever you come to America in the Bible, you say, well, I don't understand how that could happen. Well, that's okay. You're called to have faith and believe it. And Hannah prays in 1 Samuel chapter 2 there in the tabernacle, and she says, verse 5 and 6, or verse 6, sorry, the Lord killeth, the Lord maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Now notice the order of those words. It isn't that he makes alive and then killeth, and it isn't that he bringeth up and then he bringeth down to the grave, but it's the opposite way. This is speaking of a God who in Hannah's mind, in Hannah's faith, is able to cause someone to die and then raise him to life again. That's the faith that Hannah had. And then as we read in Luke 1, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. So there's no doubt here that faith had to be exercised. He believed that this could be done. 
Not only had he faith, he had persistence because it says in verse 35, he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up. And then he did the same thing again. Now it's interesting to note that what he did was very similar to what Elijah did whenever he was uh, working and praying and asking God to raise uh, the, the son in his time. And it's interesting to note that prayer doesn't always be answered in the way that we would wish or it doesn't come to pass on the first time we pray. Unless you prayed unto the Lord and then he returned and he walked about the house, he walked to and fro. Was he praying as he did that? I believe he was. And he kept on praying and he kept on seeking the Lord. Elisha's faith, Elisha's persistence, but the Elisha's victory that he experienced. And what a victory that was. It was the work of God, of course it was. But he witnessed it with his own eyes. Why? Because of his faith, because of his persistence, because he was calling upon the God he's able to do all things. And I will say here, Elisha and Elijah were both used to raise young children from death. But they had a call on God for his resurrection power to move among them. Whenever Christ was upon this earth, he raised people from uh, death. We think of the woman in Nain who was walking out after her son who was going to be buried. And the Bible says that he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. You see, the difference between Elisha and Elijah and the Lord was that Elisha and Elijah had to ask the Lord for his power. But the Lord Jesus Christ was able to say, live, arise. He has all power. And praise God, he still can call sinners dead in their sin, out of their deadness and into life eternal. And this is a wonderful thing. Friend, we have a wonderful God. And maybe today you're in this meeting and you've loved ones in your family and they're dead spiritually speaking. They're on their way to a Christless eternity. They're on their way to hell. And you prayed once or twice. Well, pray on until they answer you again. Pray on until they are alive in Christ Jesus. Keep on praying. Pray in private. Pray in public. Pray persistently until the Lord saves the soul of those whom he's laid upon your heart. And before I leave this morning, and we leave this scene of great happiness, and it has been noted by all Bible commentators uh, that the story ends so abruptly. It ends so abruptly, there's quite a lot of detail, but then all of a sudden, verse 37, she went in, fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, took up her son, and went out. That's it. That's it. I suppose in many ways we don't need to know the rest of the story because we can all imagine and we all would know what it would be like to have uh, that happen in our own homes. But there is something this morning I want to leave with you. And it's for each one this morning who is unsaved because you are like that little child laid upon that bed. You're dead. Of course, yes, you've life in your body, but you've no life in your soul. We're born dead in trespasses and in sins. Spiritually, we're dead. We need life. And only God can give it. And that is why I believe that woman went and journeyed those 15 to 20 miles to Mount Carmel because she believed that only God could do the miracle to bring life to her son. And friend, only the Lord Jesus Christ can put life within your soul. Only he can save you. Only he can cleanse you. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said the Lord Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you will be saved today, if you'll be saved from your bondage of your sin, if you will be saved from the record of your sin, if you will be saved from the eternity in hell as a result of your sin, if you will be saved from eternal separation from God, if you will be saved from a life wasted and a soul condemned, then you must come to Christ. Come to the one who gave his life that you might have life. Come to the one who shed his blood that you might be saved. Come to Jesus. I think some of the most sad words 
the Lord Jesus Christ spoke, or in John 5, 40, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. A friend, if you're in this meeting this morning and you're not saved, listen, listen as the Lord from heaven says to you, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And friend, if you do not have the life that Christ gives, you're going to be in hell for all eternity. Preacher, what I need to do to be saved, you need to take your place as a sinner. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that there's nothing, nothing I can do to save my soul, but I am asking that the Lord Jesus will come and wash me in his precious blood. Give me life. Change me, that I might be ready for heaven. Will you do that today? Graham, will you walk out of this place today with Christ, with the life that only Christ can bring? May God grant it to be so for his glory alone. Let's pray. If there's anyone would like to speak to me, I'll be at the side door here by the graveyard, and certainly we would love to point you to Christ. Maybe someone has trusted Christ during the service and we certainly would love to show you how to go on with the Lord and to give you some literature to help you in your walk with him. But friend, if you do not have eternal life this morning, you've nothing. Don't tell me about your bank account. Don't tell me about your success. Don't tell me how popular you are in this life and don't tell me what you think is going to happen when you die. The Bible says, if you die without Christ, where he is, you cannot be. And therefore, this morning, if you need to be saved, come, call upon the Lord now. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the power of God that has been displayed and recorded in Scripture and the raising of this young lad. Oh, what joy there must have been in that home. That young boy once again spoke and walked and talked. But we realize, Lord, that a greater miracle has been done each time a sinner has been transformed by the grace of God. Every time a heart steeped in sin has been washed and made whiter than snow by the blood of Christ. Every time a hell deserving sinner has been converted by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I rejoice and I thank thee, Lord, that I can stand in this pulpit today and say there's good news in this wicked world because there's a Savior who gives life to the sinner. And I pray, Lord, that you will bring people to an end of their sin today. Open their eyes that they might see. Open their hearts that they might receive. Open their minds to understand the simplicity of the gospel, to leave their sin and to come to the Savior. O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, there's still power in the blood. And therefore I pray you'll work a miracle even greater than that in Shunem. Work in Calvary free today and raise sinners to life in Christ. First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.